welcome to worship here at Holy Trinity Episcopal Church on October 4th. The order for service can be found in the epistle or starting in the Book of Common Prayer on page 355. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now let us all say the Gloria together, found on page 356. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to all people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and giving us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Exodus. Then God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuse his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. When all the people witnessed the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking, they were afraid and trembled and stood at a distance and said to Moses, You speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us or you will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, for God has come only to test you and to put the fear of him upon you, so that you do not sin. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is Psalm 19. I invite you to join me in saying it. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. One day tells its tale to another, and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, and their voices are not heard, their sound has gone out into all lands, and their message to the ends of the world. In the deep has he set a pavilion for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edge of the heavens, and runs about to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure 
and gives wisdom to the innocent. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can tell how often he offends? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. A reading from from Philippians. If anyone else has a reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised in the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have gained, I have suffered the loss of all things, and I have regarded them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith, faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now that I have already obtained this or have already reached my goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will they do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death, and lease the vineyard to other tenants who who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read read in the Scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. And it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to the people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, 
they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. The Gospel of the Lord. A hymn for Holy Week begins, There is a green hill far away outside a city wall where our dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. The hymn has it right for the most part. Jerusalem is my favorite place on the planet Earth, and so I'm something of a pedant about how it is depicted. The hill is in Palestine, far away. It is outside the walls where they stood during Herod's reign, though it's inside the current city walls. And it is both the tradition of the church and the consensus of archaeologists that the hill now marked by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre contains within it the hill called Calvary, where our Lord was crucified. You can't really tell that it's a hill now, though, because of the way the buildings are built up all around it. But it's there, because underneath you can climb down some steps and look, and the walls there are glass. And you can see the rocky outcropping that rises up overhead. Yet the hymn does have one thing wrong. The hill that was far away and on which our Lord was crucified wasn't likely very green on that auspicious day in the year around 33 A.D. It was, and still is, a stony outcropping. But for the sake of that one mistake, we can forgive Cecil Francis Alexander, the hymn writer, uh, who looking out on her 19th century Irish landscape, I'm sure couldn't help but think that all the world was as green as her dear countryside. Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull, whatever it is that we call it, was at the time of Jesus' life an abandoned quarry. For many years, the stone from that quarry had been used to build many of Jerusalem's buildings. But by the time of Christ, all the quality stone in that quarry had already been used up. All that was left was rubble, an unquarried stone that was unsuitable for use in building. All that could have been used had been. The stone that was left was the stone that the builders rejected. The desolation of that spot then made it a favorite place for Roman executions. In the lesson from Matthew, Jesus tells a parable that includes several executions. Instead of the violence being on a cross, it's in a vineyard. The wicked tenants who foolishly wish to claim the owner's harvest as their own kill each servant that the landowner sends into their midst. These ungrateful and despicable tenants even murder the landowner's own son when he goes and tries to talk some sense into them. Jesus then leads the Pharisees to name the tenants as the sinner in this parable. The Pharisees are not unaware that both Jesus and the crowds would identify them as the evil tenants of their own day. Yet they're trapped by the correct answer to Jesus' question. And in another moment of rhetorical triumph, Jesus has his own accusers to show themselves to be on the wrong side of the issue. The religious authorities were the ones who, time and again, had refused to hear the message of the prophets, all sent by God to tell the people what God expected of them. 
time and again, prophet after prophet, found himself and herself at times at least banished and exiled, if not killed. Now, God's own Son had come once and for all to show the world who God is and what God desires of God's people. And still, the religious authorities refused to hear, plotting against him every chance they got. As if to rub salt in the wound and remind them that their way would not win out, no matter who they killed, Jesus quotes Psalm 118, saying, The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. No matter what they try, no matter how they reject him and his message, Jesus will be the beginning of something new and unstoppable. Yet for an instant, it it did all seem to stop. For there on that hill, far away, just outside the city walls, rocky and hostile to green lushness, our Lord was crucified. Jesus, the stone that the builders rejected, had been killed atop the abandoned quarry full of stone that the builders had rejected. The parallel is painfully elegant. Indeed, with the death and resurrection of Jesus, the cornerstone of the new world order was set in place. On that cornerstone would rise the church, which after the temple's destruction in the year 70 would replace the temple as the central locus of worship. We who follow Jesus, who wish to be like Jesus, who pray to follow him in the way, must come to grip must come to grips with what that means for our own day-to-day lives now. Perhaps that has never been more clear for some of us than right now. The nation reels from centuries of racial inequity. Disease rages on a pandemic scale. And the current state of our political system shows all signs of implosion. What we have to say about God and how God calls us to live with one another is still very much threatening to the authorities. We place our highest allegiance somewhere else, outside of worldly power. And if our allegiance is with a power that cannot be overcome by earthly might, then our accusers become all the more threatened. If we're serious about this Jesus stuff, then we too from time to time will find ourselves cast aside and rejected, cast outside the city walls, the walls of comfortable society, and on to a heap of rubble and trash. Yet it was on just such a heap of rubble that the Lord of all was vindicated. It was on just such a place outside the walls where the vandals and wild animals ran amok that a new start was made. What seemed like rejection was actually a beginning. The cornerstone was set. The world was set on a new course 
God's love and mercy were made manifest. What then might God do with our own places of rubble and rejection? Only God knows and only God can tell. But trust this. Our footings cannot be rocked by earthquake or wind or tsunami or hurricane. Though we all know, though all that we know may fall away, though all whom we love may turn against us, we are standing on something solid and immovable. Might we be given the grace to live our lives as Jesus lived, to die to self as Jesus died, and to be raised atop a new foundation, and in our living, dying, and rising, might we bear witness to the marvelous love and generosity of our God, who even now calls all that is into this great building project that is God's dream for creation. I am thankful that the Spirit and you have called me into your midst. Together we have big work to do, building upon the cornerstone of our faith to help usher in the impending reign of God. Greensboro needs us. So let's get started. And now let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic church that we all may be one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you, that your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for Kimberly Dunn, postulant for the priesthood, and Maureen Flack and Joe Jugan, candidates preparing for the diaconate. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake that our works may find favor in your sight. 
Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. O oh Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls, and to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now the peace of the Lord be always with you. Hey y'all, I am David Umflett, and I am so glad to be here with you on this day. For those 
who are watching at home, wherever you may be, uh, just know how thrilled that I am to be a part of your community, how thankful my whole family is to be in this with you here at Team Holy Trinity. So because we can't get together in all the normal ways that we would like to, we've set up a whole series of meet and greets that are going to be sort of brief worship service and question and answer and uh, free conversation time periods. Those are available. Some of them will be in person. Some will be on Zoom. So whichever format you feel most comfortable with, the, all the signups for those are av available in the weekly epistle. And we'll do as many of those as there are people who are interested in, uh, in coming because I want to get to know you. They've done this whole professionally produced series of videos of me. I've never looked so good in, in all my life, uh, but uh, you're going to hear way too much about me and I want to learn about you. So please come to these meetings so we can get to get, get to know one another and we can get to work even in these pandemic times. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen to sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself, in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension. We offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. At the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Be known to us, Lord Jesus. 
These are the gifts of God for you, the beloved people of God. Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the peace of God that transcends all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Go forth into the world to love and serve the Lord, carrying hope and love to all whom you meet on this earthly pilgrimage. Thanks be to God.